Hello, assalamu alaikum and welcome to another program of Health is Wealth. I am your host Shabnam Riaz. Today the program that we're bringing to you is something of a, of a different nature. We usually have doctors in the program, we you know, talk about health issues. But today's issue is really, really important. It may be something. It's something that affects us all the time, but how much are we thinking about it? You know, this program might shock you and surprise you because the topic today is nutrition and spending wisely on healthy and nutritious food. Now, how many of us actually think, you know, towards budgeting our meals and actually thinking of what constitutes what we are eating and what we're giving our family. So for today's program, we are very happy to have in our studios, Mr. Fimba Kara, the World Food Program for Pakistan Country Director. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, with uh, Mr. Karan, we have Mr. Ali Ahmed Khan, who's the World Food Program Pakistan Nutrition Officer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Mr. Karan, um, thank you for taking out the time from your busy Happy schedule for being here today. Tell us about um, the World Food Programme working in Pakistan. It's been a long time here. What have been the challenges and what have you been able to achieve? Um, World Food Programme has been in Pakistan since 1968. Um, we have a long history. We've been here continuously since then. Originally, the World Food Programme was established in the mid-60s um, by the various UN bodies uh, to deal with food surpluses. And so the idea was that if countries had food surpluses, it would be useful to ship them to various countries that were having difficulties um, for whatever reason. Often it was natural disaster or man-made disasters. Mm -hmm. um, and so originally there was a few projects here in Pakistan in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. We maintained a office here because uh, as a country it has a um, unfortunate geographical position which means that there are quite often um, natural disasters which mm -hmm. nobody can do anything about. And primarily our, our function was to move large amounts of food to wherever it was needed. Mm -hmm. um, over the years we have um, developed a very good working relationship with many of the ministries in Pakistan uh, and we've also established quite a good name for ourselves in terms of having a deep field presence. In other words we have offices in remote locations, right. we have built up relationships with communities uh, and I, I think it's fair to say we're, we're, we're quite well trusted by both provincial, district and federal authorities. Uh, recently we have, um, when I say recently, in the last 10 years or so, we realized that in providing food it's also a great opportunity to provide nutritious food. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads us to developing a nutrition, nutrition capability mm. um, which not only ensures that the food is nutritious but also works with the government to ensure that nutrition is factored into government policies and government approaches. Um, and increasingly we're moving in that direction. We were heavily involved in the uh, floods in 2010 mm -hmm. and in the earthquake in uh, 2005 we were one of the first responders there mm -hmm. but we have been working increasingly with the government to ensure that they're in a position to be able to be the first responders we may from time to time offer support but we're now concentrating on the area of nutrition because mm -hmm. we realize the long-term benefits from um, solid nutrition are huge huge mm. um, Comparing Pakistan to the rest of the world, how, what are the, the sort of the different problems that you faced here and how have they been addressed? And, well, the big problems here, as I mentioned, uh, is that it is a country that, due to its geographical positioning, is prone to um, natural disasters mm -hmm. uh, and very significant ones. I mean, if you consider the floods affected 20% of the surface area mm -hmm. of Pakistan, that's a huge area. It's mm -hmm. four times the size of Ireland. Um, and so there isn't really another country I can think of so offhand. So are you collaborating a lot with the Disaster Management Authority at yes. the provincial levels? As yes, well? at, with, uh, both here at the national level and um, at the, the four provincial levels. Mm -hmm. To give you a small but I think very um, solid example is we have been uh, working with them through the generosity of donors mm -hmm. um, to develop what we call humanitarian uh, hubs. Mm -hmm. These are locations in which we can store food or the government can store food mm -hmm. in areas you know are prone to disaster so that there's food that can be distributed immediately. Mm. Obviously in looking at the location we look at places that um, there's less likelihood that access would be would be affected by whatever the disaster was whether it's a flood or an earthquake. Right. Um, and we've developed 
six of them and we're developing another two. But not only is there a hub in each of the provinces, but also there are smaller hubs in the districts that are more likely to be affected by. And the government has taken responsibility. We did a lot of training. We built the facilities. We handed over to the government. And they have actually been used. And they've been used very well. They've been very well run. We check periodically for the donors. Um, and yeah, it's that kind of thing where you know you help set it up because that is our expertise, right. um, and then you hand it over to the government mm -hmm. uh, ensure there's enough training. I mean, in the same way as, for example, if a government was putting in an information system, it right. would bring outside consultants that it knows has the expertise, but then it would take over the responsibility Taking itself. Taking the best of both worlds. Uh, exactly. Right. So, okay. in a sense, whether it's Accenture or KPMG, it's the same kind of idea. We have an expertise. Mm. Where donors will pay us to share it, and we're we're happy to share it. Right. Fantastic. Okay, uh, Mr. Ali Ahmed Khan, now tell us the situation of nutrition in Pakistan. How many people are actually aware that it's not just about eating and, you know, being full and hunger, it's about exactly what we are eating and what our children are eating? Well, the, <clears throat> the fact is that um, awareness is always an issue with nutrition in Pakistan. Um, uh, even those who can afford nutritious food, we don't really think on what we're eating. And um, generally what we eat, that's what we are. So that is always going to be an issue. And even our urban areas, which are considered to be good, wealthier quantiles of the society, mm. they have uh, nutrition indicators that are mm, very much high as compared to the WHO thresholds that the global standards have been um, earmarking for considering it to be serious or critical. Mm -hmm. So I think that is also one of the issues uh, in our well-off societies of awareness of what they have to eat, how they have to eat, and how they have to have a balanced diet so that they can get the right mix of macro mm -hmm. and micronutrients because mm -hmm. micronutrients are also very important for mm -hmm. the kids in, uh, and children in population. So how, how educated would you think that the educated class is as towards nutritional value? Well, this is somewhat, um, we'll have to see what our data says, data mm -hmm. set says. Um, but the data set is uh, um, not that clear on what our educated class is, but mm. still the indicators depict that as a whole, our country's nutrition indicators are very poor. Mm. Uh, for example, we have got 44% children that are stunted. Now, mm. Stunted means that their height is low and mm. their cognitive ability is also low. Mm. So their thinking capacity and their mental development is also mm. low. So this, this does bring us to the fact that obviously they also have an awareness problem, they also have the affordability problem, they have the accessibility problem. So as a whole, the indicators indicate mm. that we are not doing as good in nutrition as we should be. Uh, exactly. Now, Mr. Curran, 44%, that's quite a number. So how, what is the strategy behind you know, giving that awareness and, and reaching those people and reaching those children who need it most? Um, well, as Ali has made reference to, we have been working with the government um, on doing a review of where is the problem and what are the options that we could uh, do it. Um, again, as Ali has mentioned, it's, it's important to emphasize that this isn't just a problem for those who are, uh, are uh, perhaps not able to afford mm -hmm. um, food, but also uh, a lot of wealthy people uh, don't That's understand. That's so surprising. It is, but it's, it's again, it's globally, it's not unusual. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, all you have to do is look at, at, at any national television uh, mm -hmm. station anywhere around the world, and you see people who are overweight. Mm -hmm. That's a nutritional problem. Exactly. Um, or people don't get the right balance in their diet. So we're working with the government to do this review so that we can um, target specific areas and specific policies. Um, there are some easy wins which are already uh, taking place. For example, the iodinization of salt, mm. which again, uh, go into any supermarket anywhere in the world, and salt is iodinized. Mm. And it's a very simple, easy me mechanism. And of course, Pakistan is a huge producer of salt. Mm. Um, but uh, we've just recently worked with the government on a fortification policy for uh, commodities, mm. uh, fortified, if I remember correctly, with iron and uh, folic like acid, acid and um, zinc, and yeah, zinc. The wheat, flour. yeah, wheat the wheat, and yeah, oil? yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, and and these these are proven to have a huge impact um, on the nutritional status of uh, people. But of course, the next big thing is to uh, educate. Mm. And again, picking up on what Ali was saying. The education is hugely important, but even those of us who are fully aware of it, 
um, don't think about it when we're actually feeding our kids. So I'm the first to admit that from time to time I have allowed my kids to eat food that really isn't good for them because it's easy or, you know, I feel it's rushed. It's the need of the hour at it, that, that time that's sometimes. Right. And so I haven't properly planned the, um, you know, get the right food in at mm. the right time so that when it comes to the quick meal, mm. I can make a salad. Mm. Um, and, you know, maybe they can have their wheat, but at least give them a small salad beforehand mm. to get their, their basic minerals. And, and, I, and I know not all the kids, I understand, mm. uh, embrace salads, but you can make salads tasty. You uh, can make them interesting. You can make them interesting. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely yeah. true. Okay, Ali, tell us, um, you know, n nutritionally speaking, uh, how do we then tackle mindsets? How do we get them to be more conscious about what they're cooking or what they're providing for their children? And now that we have this, you know, as uh, Mr. Carr mentioned, the planning, how good are we at planning? We're, I don't think we're really so culturally great at planning, are we? <coughs> that is something for the cultural experts to uh, <laughs> delve more on. Uh, well, for us, we really have to think um, in our um, nutritionally, obviously, how we have to go about it. Um, we have to really think on our, the stronger aspects of our culture. Because the other day I was talking to somebody and uh, we were thinking that the, 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 the stomach of the child is very small. Even if we have everything available, we might not be able to give like the child might not be able to eat everything that is available for mm. them, yeah? Mm. So what? So then we were thinking, how did our grandmothers, or how did we, or our parents or were able to get what they had required? Mm. Now for that matter, in our culture, we had the strong system of our families where elders were with us. And if you remember, our grandmothers or grandparents would mm. be jerking around us all day, mm. giving us something, some to nuts, eat. some fruits, some vegetables, yeah. all the time That's in small, true. small quantities. And thing. we were getting the right mix so that we were getting all the balanced diet that we needed. Mm. So that is one of the aspects in the culture, if you talk about that, that mm. we can see. But the fact is, when we're talking about mindsets and when we talk about one family at a time, mm. it generally starts with us planning properly, mm. giving the importance to nutrition that is due, mm. yeah? And obviously then to set examples mm. for of that. Course. So if you have set goals and examples for yourself, that goals and examples then go trickle down to your family. And then, so if you're the ones making the decisions, you can invest wisely on what's coming. You can avoid junk food, you can avoid snacks, uh, unhealthy snacks, mm. and you can invest more on the healthy foods, the fresh foods, the vegetables, fruits, and a balanced diet of meats and fish and everything. So that's how you are going to do, and you have to lead ex by example for yourself, for mm -hmm. your children, for the society. So that's how you start step by step, and you can then improve right. the uh, nutrition outside. How, how many people do you think, in general, have a, a, a concept, a proper concept of what is a balanced meal? Well, that's really hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> that's really hard because to say. Because I would say that you know, when you move into the sort of uh, the rural uh, areas as well, it would be harder for them to understand that you know you need your proteins and your your fats and your carbohydrates or in how much amount. How do you tackle that? How how is that? Um, sorry, for rural areas, the 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 the, the, um, the problem is different. Hmm. Yeah, because because if you see the poverty indexes, you see their unaffordability indexes, mm. their accessibility in issues. Mm. So the, for, 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 for the rural areas or for the poor quantiles of the, of, the, of the population, it's generally about what you can get to meet, make ends meet. Mm. So for them, that is different. You can provide them with all the knowledge, mm. but if they don't have it available, they don't have accessible, they cannot afford it, mm. it's, so, it's going to be of no use. Mm. For that, that is something that we need to see how that is. WFP is doing different programs where we're providing specialized foods that is rich in micro and macronutrients, providing mm. them with the um, energy and proteins, a part of their daily requirement, and they can meet with the other part. Mm. But for the wealthier quantile, that is where the awareness is going to come. And I think of late, recently, it's a trend is increasing mm -hmm. to improve the nutrition, partly by the government, partly by the agencies that they're doing different programs, because behavior change communication is central to all our programs that we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're trying to have a strong communication team. We have a PI team. Other UN agencies also have their public information teams. And they are trying to build it up. So, but that is, that is what we have to take care. So we have to think of the two, two six strata of the society, one which can afford mm. and much which cannot afford. So that is how it's going to take place. But yes, uh, giving them awareness is 
good because at one point in time they would be able to afford exactly. something and when it, or whatever they can afford they should <laughs> afford the do the right choice and invest wisely in whatever little money they have right exactly okay um now to market good nutrition it's so easy to i mean you don't even have to market the fast food and <laughs> that's just the kids will want that anyway so good nutrition how is it marketed uh, what about celebrity endorsements and yeah well that's one of the things that we're uh, examining now is to um, get celebrity endorsement for healthy living you know that uh, you're not going to become a great cricketer unless you've had a, a good balanced diet and pretty much and you've eaten all your veggies and you've eaten all your veggies <laughs> and your, your fruit and your legumes um, but also I think that it, there's a trickle down effect um, uh, if you can get one segment of society to start um, insisting that there's vegetables and fruit available in their local shops then it begins to trickle down mm. and the images begin to change so for example, a small little change that I've introduced in our office is that when we have guests, instead of um, nice uh, chocolate biscuits, there's a choice of fresh fruit. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's those kind of changes. Government, obviously, uh, and, and your government is working on policies that encourage that kind of thing. Um, so, for example, the issue on milk, for example. Mm -hmm. Or if you look at the UK, there's been a big struggle going on about school meals. School meals, yeah. Um, and all these things send subliminal signals to people. Mm. Um, so now there's no restaurant in Europe that you can't get a good choice of salads. Mm. Whereas 20 years ago, if you asked for a salad, you would have just got a head of lettuce and that would be the... the yeah. So these things are, are, they, are, are, they trickle down in my view. Uh, people look to others for examples and of course celebrities are key to providing these kind of examples. That's why everyone smoked in the 40s and 50s. They would see the film stars smoking. Absolutely. If they saw them chewing carrots instead, one hopes that they would <laughs> move to healthy diets. Right, absolutely. How, how on board is the media with promoting this awareness towards, you know, uh, good nutrition and then spending wisely? I would think that's something that we hardly ever think of. Well, I, the, the first question is probably easier to handle since uh, we don't really have that much exposure to media but in one sense media follows the, tr the trends right mm. um, uh, and, and in some ways can set the trends but if people start demanding that um, for example there's programs about how to cook healthy mm. food mm. well then the media I, I assume would res respond and, and that's your area more than 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 ours. Even on media, we say now we do try to um, uh, engage with media in different uh, events. Uh, okay. um, as Finwar said, that when you're uh, involving ministers and. Uh, uh, different uh, different advocacy events, mm. uh, different uh, um, uh, materials that is being published with collaboration with the government. Mm. So when ministers are there to launch it, then the media does come forward. They do ask us questions. Um, recently, I've seen, um, uh, obviously, this is one of the examples that media is giving time for the topic of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Certainly, other media outlets also uh, have approached different agencies, World Food Program as well as one of them, and the government counterparts to do specific mm programs for nutrition of how uh, malnutrition is an issue in the country right. so <clears throat> it is um, uh, it is um, uh, you say going up uh, it is going up a notch mm -hmm. but uh, obviously media can play a very significant role mm. for uh, nutrition for the population um, in the context for them to spend wisely mm. in the context how the choices are made and obviously because all of these um, uh, 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 nutritious products or nutrition related products uh, are demand driven so if the media can play its correct role the mm. demand in the population would be that we need XYZ kind Kind of nutritious products right. and that would drive all the other related stakeholders for that to be it's available and then they can be able to use absolutely it. and as we've seen that you know the most marketable target audience are children of course so um what about comics books and sort of superheroes uh eating all that stuff what about Actually, that? that's good that's a very good point yes mm. uh, i i think that has a huge influence on um uh, and, and that's why the, the big uh, brand companies pay to position their brands in mm. movies because subliminally these have, have a significant impact. Mm. Uh, so yes, I think you're right, comics, um, children's programs. Um, but also I think that there's, um, the market will respond to what's, what's demanded. And a lot of foods that may be slightly out of reach of, of some of the poorer families, if the demand increases, then companies respond, mm. they achieve economies of scale and mm. the products become 
cheaper. Um, I'm thinking, for example, when I was growing up in Ireland, tomatoes were outrageously expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, but because people became health conscious and were demanding tomatoes, farmers responded mm -hmm. and, and the price dropped because they were now mass producing them. So it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mass produ production brings me back, of course, to the terrible processed foods, which are so easy to provide, uh, so easy to cook in the microwave or whatever, exactly. uh, but are, are not particularly healthy. Ten love you is about, you know, how important it is to plan in advance and to avoid processed foods. Yeah, I, I mean, I made reference to this earlier. Um, uh, having been a parent myself, I have been often tempted to hand out cereals until I read the sugar content of those cereals. And mm. Dr. Ali here helped me understand those. And I, I, I perfectly understand you put just pour them out and you put a bit of milk on it and you hand it and you think your child is getting a nutritious meal and but of course not the case. that's not the case. But then you hear, then you see in the box because it's written all these fortified minerals and that, that really attracts you. And, and that's why they put it there but of course they're not giving you the full picture they're giving you the, the partial picture and again as Ali would say it's about getting a balance right. you know you need bits of everything but mm. you don't need too much of uh, anything other than your minerals and your, your vitamins uh, and that's the marketing is, is, is focusing on one aspect but ignoring the other aspect that, uh, well, yes, in addition to being fortified, it also has huge amounts of sugar. Um, mm -hmm. And so another one, of course, is the um, soft drinks, the, the sodas. These are, are deadly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've heard up to 16 spoons of sugar can be in a single so can of, I won't mention uh, any particular brand. Yeah. <coughs> um, and I think part of the planning is not to have those available in the house because right. we're all tempted. I mean, there are times when I... Uh, desire a, a can of some soda. Mm. If it's not there, I'll mm. pick water or I'll, mm. uh, well, I was going to say make a cup of tea, but as we've learned earlier, oh, yeah. tea before We're or after me. But it's that kind of thing, making sure that there's, there's enough good things and not too many bad things in your, in your press. So that when you come to, so for example, I've now moved from cereals to boiled eggs for the, for the kids. Okay. And it's easy to, and uh, relatively cheap to buy um, a couple of dozen eggs, and um, you can boil them the night before and have them reheat in the micro if you have a micro the next morning. So those kind of, and eggs of course are very filling, they give you all your um, nutrients, mm -hmm. but interestingly enough, you take more energy digesting them than you absorb from them. So it's actually quite a good, way, good way of, of keeping yeah, your weight down, down as yeah. well. Yeah. Excellent, <laughs> exactly. those, those are great tips. Okay, we're going for a break right now, but we'll be back, don't change the channel. Okay, welcome back to the program. We are really benefiting here from your expertise and, you know, learning many things that we... There are many things that you actually don't think about. They're just, you know, they, they come into... Uh, they don't come into your sort of the way you're thinking, you know, you're, you're approaching things. To be aware of our, actually what we are eating, not how much and when we are eating, that's also something that's so important, and I'm glad that we've been able to talk about this. Um, can you tell us about... What we were talking about before the program, you told us something about tea, and I thought that was quite, you know, amazing because I didn't know that. Can you it, it's certainly uh, the fact is that uh, we, as a nation, or around the world, we see that tea is an integral part, and we drink tea right after what we have eaten. Hmm. But the fact is that tea has chelating factors, for example, that reduces the absorption of iron from your meals. Uh -huh. So what uh, is recommended by uh, nutritionists mm -hmm. is that we should um, not drink tea two hours before and two hours after uh, at least uh, our meals so that the iron that is present in our meals uh -huh. is properly absorbed and we can get the right amount of iron. Okay, that sounds like quite a lot, a big gap though. 
because um, I mean, what, for the whole two hours before you're having a meal, you shouldn't have a cup of tea. Well, because you see, when you talk about physiology of the body, uh, mm -hmm. when we ingest something or eat something, mm -hmm. our stomach is the first place after the esophagus that stores it, and this, mm -hmm. the processing starts there for the food. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the minimum amount of time that the food takes to stay inside the um, uh, stomach is two hours. Mm -hmm. So if you have tea, mm -hmm. And then within two hours, you have something to eat. Mm. So the tea would be in the stomach uh -huh. and the food would be in the stomach and the chelating factors would reduce the absorption from there. Okay. Similarly, when you have something to eat and you have some uh, um, tea after that, mm. within the two hours, the food would be there, so the tea would come along mm. and that would reduce the absorption of the iron. So this is just one of the factors of how you can um, plan Right. your life yeah. in having a healthy diet in the way that you can better utilize. Right. Yeah, because one of the things we've talked about, the accessibility, the affordability, the availability, mm. the knowledge, mm. but it's also about the utilization. And the, yeah. yeah. So, and the so you have to utilize sort of what you have. What you yeah. know. So that's yeah. how we have to think, we have it because we can plan to buy proteins, we can plan to buy vegetables, plan to buy fruits, mm. fats and everything, but you have to properly utilize them in order to get the maximum and benefit be conscious out. of, of yes. the choices that you're making so all those happy tea drinkers out there you know there's some knowledge there. i was i was shocked as well actually <laughs> i have to make some changes okay um how much of a problem is anemia uh, due to nutritional uh, availability and awareness in pakistan that's probably something i would ask ali to mm -hmm. anemia on. is very very um uh, significantly high as mm. other indicators are um, we've got around 50% of the population of the mothers that are anemic, mm. uh, women that are anemic. Children, similarly, similar indicators are in the children as well, that they are anemic and, uh, uh, and that's very high. Mm. And that can be due to multiple factors, but we've got very high rates of anemia mm. in our children and our mothers, mm -hmm. as per the data that that's, we have. That's another uh, area which you, you, you must yes. be targeting as well and w working yes. to... Um, yeah. and, and remember, the government is, is taking the lead on this mm. uh, and we're working with them and they're aware of it and uh, we're working on solutions. And it's high uh, on the agenda. It's very high on the agenda, okay. yes. What about the availability of fortified foods? Are they widely available? Well, the, the uh, salt, the iodinized salt yes. is w widely available Definitely. and um, as I mentioned, the government is working on a, um, a fortified food strategy, mm. um, mainly wheat, uh, and I think that increasingly over the next 18 months it mm. will become quite widely available. Right, okay. And because, you know, so much is about uh, creating that mindset as well and starting very young, uh, are you collaborating with schools as well in any way to get them to um, get, get children started early on? Yes, one of the big signatures of WFP right across the world is what we call school meals okay. uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a double win from our point of view, mm -hmm. because after um, providing nutrition for the, the, um, the body, the most important thing is to provide nutrition for the mind. So here's a situation where we can use um, the, the attraction of providing food mm -hmm. based on the attendance of children mm -hmm. to a family, thus minimizing the burden on them to provide the, the food. We can ensure that the food is nutritious mm -hmm. um, and we can ensure that children come to school and learn and uh, amongst the things they can learn is the importance of nutrition. And um, we're working with a number of the provincial governments. Some are doing pilot studies on this, but there are pilot studies throughout the world which show that these are are hugely beneficial. Mm -hmm. There's some concern about the cost because of course you have to distribute the food to thousands of schools and to thousands of students. Mm -hmm. But the return on investment, and I'm, I'm an accountant by profession, mm -hmm. is so huge it is well well worth it. I mean the loss to any economy by poorly um, nourished children mm -hmm. is is quite significant. I mean measures of up to three percent of GDP have been mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so providing school meals for children mm -hmm. is actually one of the most effective things that can be done and mm -hmm. I'm very happy to see that the provincial governments and the national government are buying into this idea and piloting it which is the right thing because not only are you piloting the impact but you're also piloting you know what are the kind the balance of food that you need you need to provide and you know how easy is it to source some of the foods because you're mm -hmm. distributing it to so many different places mm -hmm. um, and we're encouraging to source food locally even in some countries that we're working, we have uh, worked with the school authorities to develop school gardens where they grow vegetables and uh, 
not only do they learn how to grow the vegetables, but they begin to understand the importance of the vegetables. And that's so, so exciting it, for them. It, 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 it's an unbelievable success. The, mm. the children love it, you know, because they grow it and then they eat it. Uh, course, you know, and yeah, as a child, this is the most wonderful thing you can do, right? That would be fantastic. Yeah. For so, them, yeah. We, yeah, there's there's a lot of attention is being that paid to this. In as well? The planning has certainly been discussed at, uh -huh. um, and I, I suspect we will see that being rolled out in, in some of the provinces in the near future. That that is amazing because then that is marketing at the you That's know right. the, the very sort and of and it's changing levels. it's changing cultural perspectives mm -hmm. and really you need people to genuinely buy in to a concept and an idea rather than you can't force them to uh, and so to me this is about encouraging and getting the children to grow the the. The, uh, that's the food great. Is, I mean, yeah. then the learning as well, the yeah. vegetable itself, and then so many things. That's fantastic. We're running out of time, so quick question from uh, you, Ellie. Tell us about you know because we like to have a lot of oil in our food. How how bad is that for our health? You have to see uh, for oils. If we talk about technical terms, we have to see the type of oil we're using. There is this. Uh, which is saturated, the best one to use? The saturated um, um, uh, oils, there is unsaturated oils. So we have to see that how we have to choose a healthy oil. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have to limit the amount of oil in our food so that we can enjoy the other nutrients that we have in that context. Mm -hmm. And we will have to choose wisely amongst the context. So it is very good for us to look at the contents and those that have the unsaturated ones should be the ones that should be used and in that context. Uh, but just one thing I need to, when we're talking about planning and everything, I just mm. need to mention it there, over here is that when you're talking about investing wisely in nutrition and we're talking while we were on our way, mm. the best investment uh, for a child, mm. um, I'm talking about the child right now, is uh, the mother's milk. Mm. Because you don't really spend anything on that. That's of course, freely available to of you. Course, of course. So, so and, just that I wanted a, to and, and to do that justice, we will have a totally you know, different program on, on yeah, that. Yeah, because, but it's just so because important. we're talking about investments, so, yeah. so it does not cost you anything. Yeah. So that is the best investment you can yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. So, so that is also a very important area. And obviously, the choices, the planning of that, what we do. And mm. on the question that you ask about the oil, it's very important to um, use the oil to a quantity that is just required the bare minimum. You can see that um, uh, the oil required is generally not more than one or two tablespoons that mm -hmm. we can cook the meal in, but mm -hmm. we use buckets of it oh, in, yeah. our, uh, yeah. in our uh, cooking. In our culture, method, so in, you in, know, in, until in you can see this much oil on top of the food. And, 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 and then in top, we, they, we, we they ask them to do another round of the, oh, yeah. uh, what we call we the organic oil, tarka, uh, <laughs> what we say. Yes. So, but so that is why we're saying that it's very important to okay. choose wisely, to plan wisely of how you're cooking, what right. you're cooking, and how you're utilizing. That that is really really helpful. So, ladies, you know, a bit, uh, stay off the oil a bit as well <laughs> when you're cooking. Okay, it's been fantastic having you both in the studios. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, Mr. Finbar Curran, the country director of the World Food Program, thank you so much for being here. It's been an absolute pleasure. And also, Mr. Ali Ahmed Khan, nutrition officer for the World Food Program, thank you so much. We have really benefited from Thank your you. advice and your expertise and I'm sure the viewers are going to watch this and take lots of notes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there we are at the end of today's program. Please stay in touch with us on our Facebook page. Tell us what you uh, would like us to talk about in upcoming episodes. And um, stay happy, stay healthy. Until next week. Mm -hmm.